took this role away from Ruth, um, because Jeff Bodkin is a dear old friend and colleague of mine, approaching like 30 years, we just figured out. Um, actually, Nancy and I were pioneer doctoral students with Ruth as our advisor in the brand new program in Law, Ethics, and Health in 1986. Uh, and Jeff came to Hopkins to get to his MBA here and was also a postdoctoral fellow in that program. So he's so for all of you people who are either former Great Mall Fellows or current Tech Leading Fellows, Jeff Blackett was the very first postdoctoral fellow in bioethics at Hopkins. Um, he is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Utah and an adjunct professor of human genetics. Um, Jeff and I, one of our uh, early um, actions together, we co-chaired um, an informed consent working group of the NIH Cancer Genetic Studies Consortium. So Karen and a few other people in the room uh, did a lot of work in cancer genetics a long time ago. But Jeff is really one of the leading experts in newborn screening that we'll talk to you about today. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from Princeton and his MD from the University of Pittsburgh for Hunter Hopkins. Um, as you can imagine, his research focuses on the ethical, legal, and social implications um, of uh, genetics, research ethics, cancer susceptibility, biobanking, newborn screening, and prenatal diagnosis. He currently chairs uh, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, uh, and he's also a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Diseases in Newborns and Children and former chair of the Committee on Bioethics for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, he chairs the NIH's Embryonic Stem Cell Working Group, and he's also a, a fellow of the Hastings Center. So Jeff comes to us with an illustrious uh, career in genetics and ethics, and particularly the board screen. So please bring you up. <laughs> Thanks, Gil. What a great pleasure to be here, um, friends and colleagues. And uh, I'm back in my own mother, things have changed a bit in the last 30 years. And I really just express my internal gratitude to, to uh, had such a transformative impact on my career uh, early on. I came here to Hopkins thinking of uh, international health. I spent some time in some refugee camps and I was going to head overseas, despite the fact that we had a six week old baby at the time. <laughs> And after having that uh, proof and understanding more about the program here, it was clear that, that was the right direction in my career. So, proof. So today we're going to talk about uh, some controversies in genetic screening. Uh, oh yes, this will be your first. Uh, I do receive some compensation from Ancestry.com. Unrelated to today's presentation. Now I'm currently working with. Uh, bunch of colleagues on a uh, revision of the 1995 statement from the American Society of Human Genetics on genetic testing, genetic and genomic testing in children. Uh, that was an influential statement and there's broad uh, consensus that that needs to be uh, updated. So here are the topics that are part of that statement. So you can see there's no shortage of issues related to uh, genetic testing in kids and I think that predictive testing in higher families is going to be uh, uh, interesting uh, indications for whole genome, whole exome sequencing, uh, etc. So I'm not going to touch on uh, really any of these today except the uh, newborn screening one, which has really been one of the more enduring controversies in pediatrics. It hasn't been necessarily the most high profile discussion, but it certainly has been enduring. So that's what I want to focus on today, and that's really where much of my work has been in recent years. <clears throat> so here's an overview of my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the debate around parental permission for newborn screening, then talk about the controversies uh, in recent years over blood spot retention and use, and then just touch, if I keep control of my time, uh, a little bit about whole genome and exome sequencing in the context of uh, newborn screening. So here's the core question that I want to think about here uh, with you for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Is it ethically acceptable for the state to conduct genetic screening on children without parental permission. And if this is acceptable, when? When is this an acceptable enterprise uh, for our society to uh, undertake? So that's going to be the focus, at least, of the first part of my uh, talk today. So a little bit of background about newborn 
screening. Um, Four million kids screened per year nationally. Of course, this is a big enterprise internationally too. Most developed countries have the one screening. So four million is uh, just in the U.S. It's really the single largest application of genetic testing. And estimates vary, but this is a number I'm going by. About 12,000 infants per year diagnosed with a condition through the one screen. So if you do the math, you know that's maybe one in 500 kids screen. Other estimates are sort of one in a thousand or so will have a detectable condition. And that number will be important as we come back to the thinking about what the justification is for this whole enterprise. So we have our 50th uh, anniversary this last year. <clears throat> Started in Massachusetts in uh, 1963 and really heralded as one of the great uh, public health uh, achievements of the modern era. So as we talk about these issues, uh, you know, the implication should be that the programs are fundamentally problematic from a uh, service delivery standpoint, from the welfare of the infants uh, and population standpoint. But really, folks are, are comfortable that this has been a significant achievement. The idea is that early identification of kids with genetic, metabolic, endocrine, and sometimes uh, uh, infectious uh, diseases. The notion being that screening at birth uh, and early detection will allow interventions that will improve uh, uh, the long-term outcome for these children. Now, the programs have changed quite dramatically in the last 10 years or so. Uh, for many years, the programs were PKU, penalty-area, hypothyroidism, galactosemia, and then sickle cell coming on in the 1980s or so. So a lot of states only had uh, a limited number of conditions that they were screening for, uh, up until the early 2000s, about 10 years ago. 2013, by that period of time, all states were screening for more than 30 conditions. And this reflects uh, the impact of technology. This is a mass spectrometry that came on board and allows screening for a whole host of conditions on the same uh, platform. Raising a question that I won't deal with so much today, which is um, you're screening for one condition, let's say, but yet you get results on 20 others. What are your ethical obligations to reveal those results when they were not the target of your initial screening and may not each fulfill the criteria that we have for uh, putting those conditions on the panel? So that's been one of the most enduring challenges with newborn screening is to sort of decide what should be on the panel. We do now have the national system in place to make evidence-based recommendations for screening. Um, that's the committee I'm serving on, the, the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Health Diseases and Newborns and Children. And that makes recommendations from the federal level, even though these are state-based programs. States can still do what they want, but a fair amount of peer pressure now with the uh, uh, national system making evidence-based recommendations. So this speaks to the scope issue. What sorts of things ought to be on these panels? How do we decide that, given the rapid expansion of technologies, and particularly DNA-based technologies. Um, so this was a quote, uh, uh, gosh, now eight years ago by Dwayne Alexander uh, and Peter Van Dyke. Uh, Dwayne Alexander was uh, head of NICHD at the time. Peter Van Dyke was a uh, senior person in HRSA. Uh, they had a long article that basically said, the traditional criteria are obsolete. So here's one quote I pulled out. They said, the technology could be expanded to screen for additional disorders as mutational analysis and other multiplex technologies become available. With decisions being based more on what not to screen for, perhaps high disease, than on what to include. And you notice the perhaps in front of the, the Huntington's here, <coughs> suggesting, well, maybe we ought to be screening babies for Huntington's disease. Obviously, this would represent a, a rather significant uh, uh, evolution of the program. Active discussion right now, as I mentioned, I try to touch on this at the end of the talk. Active discussion of the use of whole genome, whole exome, uh, sequencing for newborn uh, screening. So we are emerging into that era where folks at least are seriously considering the possibility of um, this level of data acquisition on each baby. Uh, one of my favorite all-time movies, Gap. You may remember the nurse, uh, I think she's a nurse, but uh, taking that drop of blood and then a series of predictions of future health for the baby, manic depression, 42% probability. Parents weren't too pleased with the service of that. So let's get to this notion of uh, permission 
how that works. So really all states at this point, except Wyoming and the District of Columbia, have so-called mandatory newborn screening programs. Maryland was one of the states for many years that had a uh, consent process. They only had a, a handful of babies per year for which the parents would uh, decline permission. But it was one of the few states that had an opt-in approach. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, for reasons that I uh, should know but don't, they've moved away from that and have moved into the much broader club of folks who are doing uh, the opt-out model. Now, most states permit parents to opt out for either religious or philosophical reasons. <clears throat> However, now the ability to opt out is not effectively communicated. So, in fact, the vast majority of folks don't opt out. Um, this is the brochure in the bag when you've had a new baby uh, approach to patient education. And if you have the uh, time and uh, wherewithal to go through all the stuff at the bottom of that bag, you'll come across some uh, uh, brochures on uh, newborn screen. So for the most part, folks have a limited understanding of what the program is all about. Osbjorn Bolling, uh, excuse my Norwegian, this was uh, first kids diagnosed with an alpha back in 1934. Uh, lived uh, and DAG, seven years of age, four years of age, both of them were programmatically developmentally uh, delayed. He, he uh, identified uh, the enzymatic uh, problem with that uh, condition. It was, in fact, treatable with a low phenylalanine diet, which had been uh, demonstrated, at least anecdotally, not through controlled trials, but at least uh, with case examples like this by 1963. And that was the advent of newborn screening at that point. So here was a publication that illustrated the potential contrast between kids who were um, not identified at birth and the sister who had been identified by virtue of her brothers being affected uh, and being put on the diet. And the illustration here is to show uh, the significant difference in developmental outcomes for these two kids. So there was a lot of excitement in that period of time to uh, implement this uh, form of uh, screening in the newborn period for the uh, welfare of kids. So here are the arguments in favor, uh, and next slide sort of uh, uh, contrary to this question of mandatory screening. This did arise, and I'll emphasize this a little bit more later, in a particular political context. The Kennedy administration, for example, uh, was uh, in Washington at the time, and Kennedy said had a real dedication to uh, a mental health disorder, developmental delay, and so they had a real receptive ear at the federal level for uh, addressing this uh, problem on a national level. So the arguments for mandatory screening at the time were, first of all, that there were dramatic benefits for the affected kids. That's really a foundational uh, issue. Uh, the magnitude of the benefits was felt to be so profound that it would be inappropriate, the argument would go, to allow parents to deny that benefit to the children. Limited burdens and risks associated with screening, just to heal poke. Of course, there are false positive screens and other sorts of uh, adverse impacts that, that can occur, but for the majority of babies, uh, it's a heal state. <clears throat> Historically, too, the, this landscape uh, uh, has changed, but at the time, uh, there were quite a bit of uh, public support for kids with significant developmental delays in state-run institutions. So much more direct burden on the state to support kids with uh, uh, developmental abnormalities than is uh, uh, the case at this point. And then basically, mandatory approaches permit high efficiency and efficacy. You pretty much get almost everybody. So what are the arguments against mandatory screening? And these are all um, prominent arguments uh, to this day. Uh, traditional respect for the parental role in health care about children. Uh, sort of coupled with the a priori risk is low for the large majority of new ones. I think our society has been comfortable for quite a while in overriding parental decisions when it's clearly threatening for the life of them of the child. The Jehovah's Witness uh, case, blood transfusion sort of circumstance is familiar and I think relatively settled within society. The question in this context uh, is certainly life and limb in terms of the effect of the kid, but the a priori risk of any one individual child being affected is low. So the argument is parents ought to have the authority to make that sort of decision about their children. <clears throat> These are conditions that are not public health threats, they're threats to those kids, 
uh, and their family, but it's not an infectious disease where the state might step in uh, to say we have uh, authority to control this by virtue of risk to other individuals. Large majority of parents will choose to uh, have their child screened. Uh, this is clear from lots of experience that folks make what we would consider perhaps to be reasonable and appropriate decisions about the health care of their kids, so it's not like you have to force them uh, to do so. And then lastly, more informed and engaged parents will be more effective as system participants. Families and parents themselves have to respond to this information. They have to understand the import of it when they get that uh, call from the clinician. They have to get the child in and they have to maintain the, the intervention. And so the, the notion here is that it's really yet to be validated, but if families are more informed through an informed consent process and more engaged as partners, they'll be more effective as systems. And Lady Ross has been one of the more articulate advocates of that uh, particular position. But all of this discussion has occurred for the most part in academia. Really not so much in health departments per se. Health departments, um, in my experience, don't question the notion of mandatory screening. That's a bedrock uh, aspect of the programs that is not seriously questioned uh, because it supports the efficacy of the programs. They're interested in getting every single baby. And anything that looks like a threat to that uh, goal uh, is a problem. Now, it does permit limited education and engagement with parents. And you see that as a, a feature or a bug of the system. Right, it's a bug if you want to promote parent education. It's a feature if you don't want people to really opt out of uh, screening. So uh, we'll see how this came back to bite newborn screening programs in recent years, but for the most part, newborn screening has flown below the professional radar and to some extent the public radar, uh, because programs, I think, have seen an advantage in having it uh, have a low profile. Again, the brochure uh, in the bag has been the educational approach. So there's been only one case that has really challenged this from a legal perspective. This was a Nebraska case. As I mentioned, there are several states that ostensibly don't have the ability to opt out. But this was the only case uh, in, in which this was actually challenged. This was Mary and Josu and I, who were uh, fundamentalist uh, Christians, and who, with interpretation of a certain phrase in Leviticus, felt that it was um, contrary to religious teaching, biblical teaching, to uh, draw blood from a child. So they had a first child, and they claimed First Amendment rights to decline newborn screening for that child. Went to court, uh, they lost. But the state did not enforce the screening. The child was not screened. Well, I had a second child, Joel, born at home. Uh, a couple now claim having lost the uh, federal uh, suit, uh, constitutional claim, for claiming the Nebraska Constitution as superseding federal constitution, saying that there were greater religious protection within Nebraska's uh, state constitution, and therefore they could, uh, on a religious basis, uh, decline and more screening. Well, the state disagreed, the state literally had policemen come to their home, take the baby out of the home for a five-day period of time until the newborn screening results uh, were back, and then brought the baby back to uh, the parents. The newborn screening was normal. So this went up to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court then said, uh, first of all, the newborn screening law does not violate the state constitution regarding uh, our religious protections. But they also said it was improper to consider um, newborn screening, the, the, the failure to accept newborn screening as child neglect per se. They said that could be part of a pattern of behavior of the parents that one might use to demonstrate uh, parental neglect. But simply refusing newborn screening was not in and of itself neglect. Now for me, I don't know where that leaves the state in terms of its ability to actually enforce the law uh, as written, and whether in fact the state can still uh, want to make the claim that they can move in with police authority to uh, conduct newborn screening on a baby that does not have uh, an a priori risk of any particular condition. Now, I'll show you a little bit of our data here in a minute, but for the most part, what uh, several public surveys have shown is that the parents themselves and the public don't have a strong opinion about this issue. About half of parents like the notion that uh, they would get uh, their permission to conduct newborn screening, and about half the parents will say, uh, no, I think it's okay. Um, and I think a consistent 
theme here is that people want choice, but whether it's an opt-in or an opt-out is something that's less significant to people as a uh, um, mechanism of choice. So we don't have a clear mandate from uh, uh, the public about how to uh, address this issue. So here's some of the evolving challenges now. Uh, I mentioned this emerged in a particular context. Um, dramatic benefits of EKU and hypothyroidism. Uh, and at the time, the reluctance of the medical profession to adopt screening as a standard of care. The American Academy of Pediatrics was opposed to uh, mandatory state screening programs in 1963 because they made the claim that we don't have enough data to know how effective this screening is. There's not been a controlled trial of uh, dietary implementation. We don't know enough to, to take this step. Well, it was enough political momentum behind the screening that it got adopted. And these factors actually still uh, pertain. We still see advocacy groups being quite articulate and quite effective at the state legislative level to mandate conditions uh, prior to the time when there's a good uh, data set to demonstrate efficacy of uh, early interventions. And as mentioned, the state will support the children of Crown Belt and Lake. Now, that's, that's a picture of the Willowbrook School uh, back in the day. So here's a new context, though, that, uh, that are challenging uh, how we're thinking about this. Conditions for which screening provides less dramatic benefits. There's no um, surprise at the start of PKU, really one of the most dramatic uh, improvements through dietary manipulation of a, a genetic condition. Well, there aren't very many things like that. Genetic conditions are uh, notoriously difficult to treat in many circumstances. And these conditions are rare enough that it makes it difficult to develop a good data set to demonstrate efficacy because you've got cases scattered uh, randomly across the country. So some of the discussion now around conditions that aren't on the panel but yet raise these sorts of questions. Fragile X, for example. Nothing you can do that will um, fundamentally change the course of that. But you can do early intervention and potentially change uh, some of the developmental outcomes from the kids much less dramatically than uh, um, he can do them. Spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. These are kids who, uh, with type 1, will typically die by the time they're about three years of age. There are now some pharm uh, pharmacologic interventions that are promising that suggest that it's a possibility that we may be able to help kids live till they're four or five years of age. Is that the sort of benefit that warrants population screening? particular population screening on a mandatory basis. And where would we draw the line in that vast gray area between PKU and SMA or fragile X in terms of the right criteria to include within such a uh, context? So discussion also whether benefits to parents are sufficient for screening infants. Reproductive risk information so the parents don't have a second effective child before the first child is diagnosed. And then uh, um, Elimination of so-called diagnostic odyssey. Families go through very difficult times with these kids with rare conditions um, to find the right diagnosis. And this uh, screening would eliminate that. Even in the absence of something to do for the child, you would eliminate that burden on families as they uh, uh, search for the right answer for their particular child. Also, what we're seeing now is bedside testing capabilities. And this is going <coughs> to continue to explode. Uh, now, cyanotic general heart disease is on the recommended uh, panel, uh, but there was a great deal of difficulty. We made that recommendation from the Secretary's Advisory Committee, and the states just uh, hit the ceiling to a certain extent by saying, well, what's the role of the state health department when you're doing pulse oximetry screening in the hospital and reporting those results directly to the family? What's the role, then, of the state and the mandate that uh, might occur from uh, state involvement? <clears throat> And certainly if we get the DNA-based platforms where you might actually be able to do what's illustrated in Gattaca, get a report within four hours, um, what's the role of the health department uh, uh, then? So here's a quick history of the uh, debate. Um, National Academy of Sciences uh, meeting in 1975, or committee in 1975, recommended that newborn screening not be mandated by law. So this is 12 years after the advent of the program. It had gone national by this point. The Institute of Medicine report in 1994 reported mandatory offering of newborn screening. So make the mandate for the clinicians. Make them offer it, but don't necessarily mandate it for the uh, recipients, the families. Uh, AP Committee on Bioethics in 2001 
chairing the committee at that point, and it literally took us uh, four years to get this statement through the academy, largely based on uh, disputes around this permission issue for newborn screening. What we eventually negotiated was a uh, uh, support for uh, research on an informed consent process. How does how would informed consent work uh, functionally? And would folks, in fact, um, decline <coughs> newborn screening? 2008 Presidential Council uh, on this, uh, specifically on newborn screening. <clears throat> and they say that the mandated tests, uh, the mandates are okay, but they should be for uh, only conditions that fit the strict criteria. And then we ought to have a second tier, voluntary screening for other tests. So a two-tiered system where you get permission for some and not permission for others. 2013, uh, AAP, uh, American College of Medical uh, Genetics statement. They teamed up this last year for uh, their statement. Uh, Lenny Freeman Ross was the uh, chair of this uh, uh, group. And they did um, support the mandatory offering of newborn screen. So we have not mandatory for parents, but mandatory for clinicians to offer. After education counseling, they said parents should have the option to refuse. But they weren't saying how the permission should be documented. They didn't want to go so far as to say you have to have a consent form, because I think everybody recognizes that the consent form approach adds a whole new layer of complexity to the process. But they said you need an affirmative agreement, basically, by parents to go forward. So this is uh, this statement is something else that's sort of flown a little bit under the radar. Uh, I would think this would have created quite a bit more stir within the um, public health community, uh, but it hasn't. Perhaps because the statements were a little bit ambiguously worded. So here's my perspective right now. You can tell from that, my earlier comments about the Academy's committee, I was more of a supporter of uh, informed permission at the time than I am uh, now. I think there's no question that parents have a right to be informed about testing for their children. That's a, that's a bedrock principle. Information should be out there about that. Exactly what that information might uh, consist of, of course, would be uh, subject to further discussion. I do think programs may be more effective if parents are better engaged. The media newborn period, though, uh, is really just a terrible time to obtain informed consent uh, about uh, complex testing for low-risk events. Now babies are staying a much shorter period of time than they did uh, uh, traditionally. Uh, parents have so many other issues that are immediate import to uh, learning about that baby, getting to know that baby, healing themselves. But this is simply not a time where uh, I think an effective informed consent process can be uh, undertaken. So it's really that efficacy issue that I think is fundamental. Now, can you get people to sign a form? You, you, of course you can. Very much like HIPAA. You know, what's happened to HIPAA? Is that now a thoughtful engagement with people about their privacy rights? No. It's, it's one of the things you sign. And so that's the risk of uh, any sort of consent process is it would collapse into a uh, a form signing uh, opportunity. So I support an opt-out approach with parental education. <clears throat> I think we're, what we need to do, and what we currently have uh, some NIH funding to do, is work to provide more effective prenatal education. And this is so consistently coming out of the studies where folks say, you know, I was pregnant for nine months. <laughs> Very interested in anything related to the baby. Why don't you tell me about this thing then? And if we could develop an, an effective uh, communication process between prenatal care and postnatal care, we actually might be able to record decisions made at that period of time in the postnatal period. I'm sure that's coming, but we're not here uh, yet. So uh, I do think uh, further consideration of a two-tiered approach uh, is possible, and to some extent that's existed, a little bit less so now in the past, but there are commercial big folks who will do things for a whole host of things. That's for folks who have the resources to be able to pay for it. And really, one of the beauties of the two horn screening system has been its egalitarian approach where every baby gets it regardless of the family's financial situation. Uh, I think uh, the ASHG statement um, is uh, still uh, in evolution, but I'm pretty sure this is uh, uh, what it's likely to say. So I think we will see a difference between uh, ASHG and the AAP on this particular issue. All right. So let me talk a little bit about residual blood spots. Do I have to, uh, to one? To one kid. <laughs> All right, we're going to blast this. Residual blood spots is a uh, fascinating controversy. Uh, 
Um, residual blood's available on virtually every patient. You get extra blood in case you have to do retesting, but the testing works uh, adequately in the vast majority of circumstances, so you have leftover blood. Many states retain these for a variety of purposes. Uh, QA, QI uh, is the single largest reason, particularly for effective kids. Forensic uses, occasionally this blood is the best sample available for uh, identifying the remains of a child, <clears throat> or for figuring out what a child died of a couple years ago when you have a new suspicion with uh, uh, perhaps a, another child in the family. And biomedical research, and that's the one we're really focused on primarily uh, today. So this data is a little bit old, but it gives you the bottom line uh, impression, which is still correct. The states are all over the map on how long they keep these things. You notice indefinitely is on the left. That constitutes California and New York, for example. Uh, anything longer than about six months is more than what you need for the clinical uh, uses of those specimens. <clears throat> so they're being saved for non-service uh, reasons. So 40% of state programs keep them for a year longer. 54% of infants going to the U.S. have spots stored for 18 years or more. And it comes as a surprise to uh, many people, and as we've done a lot of public dialogue about that, I mean, you can sort of see people's jaws drop when you tell them, that, yes, the state's got your baby's blood spot. Research applications uh, are uh, potentially dramatic. Um, the entire population of newborns and children because you say long enough, you got everybody. <clears throat> but uh, having the entire population of newborns and children is uh, a pretty extraordinary resource. Genetic epidemiology, uh, infectious agents you can figure out uh, because uh, infection uh, exposures in pregnant women may be detectable in newborns, whether or not they're infected. Prenatal exposure to environmental agents is uh, feasible through these spots, and they really have potential great utility. So here's a lot of the public reaction, though, or at least from those folks who brought suits that I'll tell you about. I'll help. The government has my DNA. <clears throat> not sure why that woman's smiling. This is a <laughs> serious issue. <laughs> so two lawsuits were uh, brought. First one in Minnesota, uh, brought by 17 parents against the state, based on Minnesota's genetic privacy law. And that requires consent for genetic testing. Originally dismissed by the local court, uh, subsequently uh, uh, over, uh, overturned by the state Supreme Court, which interpreted that blood spots themselves constitute genetic information. So not genetic information that is uh, a yield from a genetic test, but the spots themselves they were considering to be genetic information. So a bit of a odd interpretation of many people's uh, uh, likes. But now blood spots can't be stored without parental consent, so they've gone to an uh, opt-in model for storage. Texas had a very different, uh, families in Texas have brought suit had a very different claim. Uh, they claim violation of the uh, Fourth and I think also Fourteenth Amendments for unlawful search and seizure. Well, this was an immediate alarm to everybody throughout the state because we're all familiar at how um, residual clinical specimens are retained and used for research purposes. So imagine the state uh, legal system deciding that that's unlawful search and seizure. It would have implications far beyond the newborn screening. Perhaps this is the point I want to make a little earlier, which I think this issue around retention of residual specimens and use um, for research purposes uh, outside the, the scope of the original clinical indication is sort of a microcosm of a much larger set of issues. You know, Henrietta Lacks, to a certain extent, uh, times four million a year. So uh, they were. Uh, trying to settle this suit, the Texas Tribune then came forward with a story with how the spots had been uh, shared with our Forces Laboratory to build a mitochondrial DNA database. And that sort of uh, highlighted everybody's worst fears of how things might be, um, in their perspective, misused. So the state settled out of court and destroyed five million blood spots that had been stored uh, uh, over a period of time. This has so alarmed states across the country around this whole issue that everybody at this point is we're walking on uh, uh, thin ice with respect to the management of these issues because of these uh, uh, types of suits. So here's a study that uh, our team did uh, in Utah, and I just wanted to study and look at a variety of different issues related to this storage question. I'm going to give you a little bit of the data that we uh, acquired. We had a couple of questions. 
What's current public policy regarding intentional use of spots? And Michelle Lewis, who's back to remember uh, uh, here, was uh, uh, our lead uh, investigator there and just a great player to work with. Secondly, what are public attitudes about the retention and research use of residual blood spots? And perhaps more specifically, does more information about these issues increase or decrease public support? So this is critical to an education mission. If folks learn about this and say, well, gosh, now that I understand this, this sounds like a terrible idea, and, uh, you know, count me out. Or, more a matter of saying, okay, now that I understand it, I get it, uh, I think it's fine. So we didn't know which way that was really going to go. So what are the ethical and policy issues in the retention and research use of the uh, uh, blood spots? So these are just the publications that emerged out of that uh, collaboration. <clears throat> so, uh, 3,800 plus uh, respondents across the country. Um, pretty good mix uh, from uh, uh, racial and ethnic background, a fair number of parents with young uh, kids. 60% um, mountain states and 40% non-mountain states. And then you can see we had uh, predominantly women who responded here. We had three different uh, outreaches. Focus groups, met with them directly. Uh, surveys that were conducted uh, uh, over the telephone or on paper. And then the knowledge networks, which is a national uh, probability sample of individuals who had technology-based uh, uh, ways to respond to uh, surveys. And what we did was we created a video about the issue and uh, offered that video as an educational intervention for about half the group, and the other half of the group had no uh, education about it beyond some description in the materials that would be uh, sort of somewhat similar to what a consent form might contain by way of information. So here's some of our results. Did you know that these results were done? Uh, pretty even split there, about half those. And, and this is the newborn screening test themselves, not the residual blood spots. Did you know that newborn screening was done? So about half people were aware of that. Now supportive of people are health departments doing these blood tests on all new babies. Well you can see the dramatic level of support. It's very supportive on the left, somewhat supportive, somewhat not supportive, and then not supportive at all. So uh, really 93% of folks were um, either very supportive or somewhat supportive of newborn screening. So this is quite consistent. Folks understand the importance of these um, tests. So here we get into the retention issue. Do you think it's all right that these tests are done without the permission of the parents? Clearly the single largest category was definitely not. But 25% said definitely all right, and then a smattering in the middle. So this is sort of a, this is a kind of public policy challenge. How do you use um, public opinion to uh, help guide policy uh, development when you have this sort of spectrum, and your single largest group said this is just a terrible idea. How concerned would you be if the health department saved the leftover blood samples from babies after the tests uh, were done? So 25% again, yeah, not at all concerned, only a little concerned, 30% uh, very concerned. Some health departments keep samples only, this is the information we provided to the response. Some health departments keep samples only if parents agree to this by signing a form. Other states, in, in other states, all samples are kept unless the parents contact the health department and say that they want their sample destroyed. So that's the opt-in versus opt-out uh, choice. What do you think is the best thing to do? So clearly a uh, majority of folks, strong majority here said we like the consent form approach. So final question, uh, after thinking about these questions for the last few minutes, you want your final opinion, do you think it's all right to use these leftover samples for doing important research? <clears throat> and we see a strong uh, support uh, for that. Now, of course, you'll notice how we phrased the uh, question here. First of all, we thought that simply answering the questionnaire and variety of different uh, scenarios posed would give them a, a concept of all the issues that were relevant to this, so that's why we reiterated this question at the end, but also included important research here. And I think one of the things we learned from a lot of our outreach to the public is that the public has no idea what research is all about. And they, we heard probably half a dozen times that folks said, you know, I think I'm okay with this as long as you don't clone my baby. It's like, well, okay, I think we can guarantee that that's not going to happen. People can, um, describe what the benefits of health research are to a certain extent, but they don't have any concept of what research is about. And they really do think that researchers get these things and do whatever they 
And so as soon as you begin to describe some of the simple mechanisms like peer review and IRB, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Uh, and they, uh, uh, the level of concern goes down dramatically. So we wanted to make sure folks weren't thinking about potentially trivial uses of these things, which for the most part don't happen. So support for retention and use generally associated with educational view movie viewing. So watching the movie made folks more supportive of retention uh, and use. Female gender and more uh, liberal political ideology was associated with uh, retention and use. It probably makes some sense. Um, support generally was not associated with, I mean, no association, not states reasons, so we're not too odd out there. Uh, race and ethnicity was not a, a factor normally. So, conclusions from that, uh, and similar work, strong support for new much training clinical services, general support for sample retention and research use, desire for parental choice with an opt-in uh, choice uh, substantially greater than the opt-out, and then more information is associated with greater support. Uh, Yvonne Bombard of Canada did something similar, uh, study with uh, Canadian citizens, and a similar sort of uh, uh, set of public policy questions up there, and uh, they found broad support also in that context for uh, use of uh, residual samples for a variety of different, uh, with opinion also being split on the extent of parental decision. So here's our policy recommendations that came out of that uh, study, and um, fairly straightforward. Support for retention use of samples. We think these things really could be useful for uh, child welfare, and that having access to them uh, would be uh, beneficial and important. But transparency with the public. I think where these states got sued was because they were flying low labor radar. And when folks discovered this, like, what, what in the world's going on? How could these states be saving these things without uh, uh, letting parents know? So better information for parents, uh, probably in the prenatal period, better information for the general public. Parental choice. Uh, we're suggesting that both the opt-in and the opt-out are acceptable ways to go. Uh, as long as the education is there, I think uh, that's probably been our bottom line, that the mechanism of approval is less important than the quality of the education. And there has to be robust research oversight mechanisms like an IRB, like a scientific review committee, so that you know these scarce resources are being used for uh, appropriate reasons. So management of the residual blood spots uh, is one context for a much larger debate over uh, research use of residual so this is posing the same set of questions that uh, have become familiar in recent years about uh, those uses. What should be the nature of patient choice here? How much transparency is appropriate? Are there effective means to inform patients? <clears throat> and to what extent does anonymization uh, eliminate ethical uh, concerns? So we did a whole series of focus groups around uh, Utah and, and the Rocky Mountain West about access to electronic medical records and residual clinical tissues for uh, research purposes. And for the most part, what we found was, again, folks were very reassured to know that there's a whole process that investigators have to go through to get approval for their uh, research. Um, we uh, specifically proposed to them, we said, we think the uh, opt-out approach is uh, uh, the most effective way to go, figuring out how to administer an opt-in approach for patients who are repeatedly coming into the hospital and perhaps offered the same choice multiple times. It was a nightmare from an administrator standpoint. So. Um, that was weighed heavily on us. And so we said, given these sorts of situations, what do you think about uh, well, an opt-out approach? Would that be acceptable? And we really found rather broad uh, support for that mechanism. Again, contingent on the fact that people do and did have a choice. So our current work now is uh, efficacy and impact of prenatal education about newborn screening. We've again created uh, uh, multimedia educational tools for use in pregnancy. And we're just beginning to analyze data on about 750 women from California, New York, and Utah uh, who've had uh, prenatal education about both newborn screening and uh, retention and research use of residual blood spots. And we have, uh, uh, along with uh, Hopkins and a few others, we have a, a P20 Center of Excellence that's been funded. Our focus is on population-based genetic screening in healthcare women and children. The prenatal and newborn uh, screening. And our real emphasis there is on public education and the informed consent issues. How do we effectively communicate information about uh, screening technologies in these types of 
context. So we're looking at multimedia platforms, we're looking at game platforms, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, theater uh, approaches to help us to communicate. So we think that there's uh, creative ways and better ways to do this than what we've traditionally done. So, uh, almost my last slide here. So what's happening at the national level? NICE uh, has funded uh, $25 million worth of uh, research on um, whole genome, whole exome sequencing in the context of new screening. Uh, and each of these has a somewhat different focus that I've listed here. So, um, Children's Mercy Hospital has focused on NICU uh, babies, uh, Brigham and Women's focused on healthy kids, um, screening for current and future uh, disorders, focused on healthy infants uh, and those with metabolic disease. So, different focuses for these uh, studies. Um, and I want to just raise it here to kind of plant a flag here because I just think this is such a dreadful idea. The use in sick kids to better understand metabolic conditions, to better understand the genetic variants that kids have that may impact the outcomes for those particular kids, may influence what you decide to, to use for treatment for those kids. Kids who are sick can't figure out what's otherwise going on. Two publications just in the last few weeks that clearly demonstrate uh, for kids about 25% will have a hit rate in terms of figuring out a genetic etiology for those conditions. Not to say you necessarily have to do something about it, but knowing is a big deal for, uh, for families. So it's very useful in those sorts of contexts. How much sense does it make in a public, in a population-wide screening context? Uh, I think it's a dreadful uh, idea. And just on cost alone, if you got the cost of uh, whole genome sequencing down to $1,000, for the analytic piece alone, not to mention even the, uh, the interpretation, that's $4 billion for kids across the country. And at least from my perspective, if you're going to spend $4 billion on kids, I can think of some better ways to use it than uh, whole genome sequencing. So at a minimum, we have to first determine whether whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing is a helpful approach to otherwise healthy people. Do you produce information that's useful for folks to uh, uh, impact their health care? I think that's the bottom line. Uh, question before folks should get too far down the road here on uh, thinking about sequencing uh, babies. So, general conclusions. Uh, these genetic technologies uh, continue to improve. Uh, clinical validity, clinical utility have been real challenges uh, over the years. Those are continuing to get better. Public health context for screening enhances efficiency and efficacy, but it undermines contemporary values about choice and engagement. I think as we see a lot of different types of research moving from the more traditional uh, investigator research participant relationship in a, uh, in a clinic room to population, big data, hospital wide, uh, nationwide sorts of data sets, we're increasingly removing ourselves from a context in which the original consent paradigm uh, works the best to the extent that it. To the extent that it works. So I think this is one of the contexts in which we're challenged by this, the sheer volume uh, and complexity of the services and how to best uh, promote choice in a meaningful way. So challenges are going to remain over how much information you generate and communicate about children at various stages of their lives and the role of parental education and permission and genetic uh, testing. Uh, these are issues that are not going to uh, disappear uh, anytime soon. So thanks.
child in the family who didn't have the PKD diet and the younger girl who did have the PKD diet and said, you know, we've now been doing the screening for X number of years and it used to be that all kids got the screening, but we're thinking about having it so that parents, you know, have to choose. Do you think all kids should still get it? Or do you think parents should choose? And I know that that's a very stark alternative framing, but the only reason I raise this is that I, in exactly the same way, do surveys and draw sort of morally relevant conclusions from it. And it's so complicated to figure out what people think. Yeah. So I want to know what you think about that, if you're also making recommendations. Well, and this is uh, not normally the type of research that you lose too much sleep over, but I lose sleep over that, that exact issue. Because how can you have a sort of a priori opinion about what you think is sort of appropriate policy to get craft a questionnaire or a process to garner opinion that, that is adequately neutral? And so I really struggled with that issue, and I don't know that we've uh, got a good answer. I would say that it's our approach to this with how we've done focus group, which is to create movies and sit in two hour focus groups with folks and let people explore, ask lots of questions, explore all the issues. I think probably gets you closer to um, uh, unbiased public opinion than maybe just how you word a survey where folks don't necessarily have much background and they're trying to glean from your question, you know, what, what's, what, what do I think is the right answer here when I haven't thought about this uh, at all before. So I think that the approach we've chosen to use here gets us a little bit closer to that, but I still think it's a fundamental uh, problem that uh, I don't know that there's a good way to get around. And what we're worried about is guiding people. But on the other hand, what we're worried about is some false sense of equivalency. So we're going to tell you about the pros and the cons. And we're going to make the cons sound just as bad as the pros sound good. right? When in fact, if you look at the example of uh, a residual blood spike used for research, there's never been an example of misuse of those samples. You know, hundreds of projects over time, thousands, tens of thousands of it. And, you know, the whole enterprise that a lot of this uh, refers to is a remarkably safe enterprise, at least if you're looking at um, tangible welfare harms to the uh, research uh, participants or sample donors. You know, if you look at the breach of privacy as a harm, then that's a little bit different conversation. So, you know, we didn't want also to falsely portray this as scary and problematic research when in fact it's not. And so, uh, I think if you look at the stuff, it may come across as somewhat reassuring, but mostly because I think folks can be legitimately reassured that this is uh, not a highly abusable enterprise. Yeah, thank you again for a lovely talk. Just a, a brief historical perspective. A brief historical perspective. I've been on the Hopkins faculty for a number of years, and I can remember back uh, I hate to say 40 or 45 years ago when PKU screening was first really rolling out and uh, strategies were being developed. And here at Hopkins, uh, uh, Tony Holtzman uh, was instrumental in um, favoring and championing the, the idea that parents should get consent. None of this testing should be done without consent. And at that time, he was really a lone voice in the wilderness, uh, at least to my recollection. He was, oh, this is ridiculous. Why go through the bother of having people consent to this? And well, the logistics are very difficult, et cetera. Um, uh, so there's been quite an evolution uh, since that time. Uh, I would like um, to get your um, impression, I think, from your last comments uh, at the end of your talk. You probably covered it. but. In many research projects now involving children, pharmacogenetic studies are being done, and whole genome sequencing is being done, particularly to look at specific uh, uh, drug receptors or other genetic uh, factors. And of course, in doing this, one is able to pick up uh, a number of mutations which may or may not increase susceptibility to disease in the near future or far distant uh, future among the, the children or their parents. And it's, I think it's a challenge for researchers to determine how much to reveal to the families at that time and how much not to reveal. Thank you. Yeah, and let me just say that's probably the single hottest issue right now under uh, a national uh, discussion, both for kids and adults. We're trying to draw lines around, um, first of all, what should we look for? Some of these platforms, you know, the 
results don't necessarily pop out in front of you. You've got to look for those results. So what should uh, we look for and uh, what should we report once we find certain things? And I've at least have been convinced by the ACMG's argument here to say that come across a BRCA1 mutation in a newborn, normally in a high-risk family you would be doing BRCA1 testing in a newborn, but in the context of that's the incident case, and one of those parents is a mutation, and I do think you need to uh, reveal that information back to the family. So I think that the, that debate, at least for me, has changed my thinking about uh, that particular paradigm of adult onset disease testing for uh, kids. But there's so many questions there that have to be answered. And I don't know what Farm is doing about uh, those particular uh, issues. Clio is another aspect of that that's just enormously problematic. And I would say, one, uh, getting back to your first point, though, just very quickly, um, Dr. Fabian had a paper published in 1982 on this issue in which you looked at the consent process here in Maryland and said that it was only about a five-minute process or so. So consent could be uh, done feasibly within the clinical context, uh, although I think the arguments you subsequently developed were in favor of mandatory screening for PKU, but not necessarily committing yourself to other conditions down the, the road. So you can see that debate uh, is 30 years old. Uh, what recommendations are being made or discussed, or do you think should be made regarding uh, encouraging and facilitating screening in young people before, before pregnancy related to uh, um, looking at couples and yeah. what they're carrying? Yeah, and this is another uh, exploding area with chips being developed now that carry multiple um, variants for carrier status. And uh, I think it's one of the most problematic domains because I think the notion of carrier status is opaque. I don't think people in general population uh, have easy access to the distinction between being a carrier and being affected with the condition and of course sickle cell uh, experience from uh, 30 years ago or so sort of illustrated that problem. So I think this is a domain where the technology is being heavily uh, pushed by the technology developers and to some extent by the um, obstetric faculty long before we have an effective way to communicate these sorts of results to, to couples and help them understand the implications. I mean, the simple scenario where you have a woman who comes up with five positive uh, findings on rare carrier states, but partner didn't want to come in. What, what do you do with that information? I think that's uh, uh, seriously problematic, especially we're uh, doing some work with our Genetic Science Learning Center, uh, very preliminary at this point, and actually our gaming uh, arts folks at the University. The uh, University of Utah is one of the stronger uh, gaming arts uh, departments in the country. So to think about how to make those sorts of results much more accessible to people, but uh, I think we're going to see some serious problems in the very near future about that. So that kind of actually um, relates to the question that I had, which was whether you've learned anything so far in your empirical work that kind of speaks to the, the issues that might arise if you push the more screening education into the prenatal period as well. I would find mine, there's a little bit of array of new testing options like an IPT and carrier panels that are already being offered. And then sort of, you know, as, as a kind of related to that, you know, the fact that there's really no limitation right now on industry in terms of what they can push into the clinic prenatally. So that there could be, a, you could imagine, a time quite soon when people will be out there testing prenatally that, you know, it's the same testing they might get from the state who most great So, I mean, is there anything that you've learned um, about how to communicate about all of that during yeah. a very limited period um, using technology or otherwise? Well, probably only a couple of things. I mean, what I would say we've learned enough to know what uh, works and that we know what doesn't work. Um, we've done a fair amount of work with, in this particular arena uh, on the general assumption that I think has been well proven that folks don't need to know everything. And you will hear this not infrequently from folks who are metabolic conditions. If they really want me to sit down and explain glycosemia to families, that's, that's not going to happen, right? Folks don't need that information. They don't want that level of information. They want a couple of core points. And we've tried to articulate that in a recent publication with the residual blood spots. So there's really half a dozen things that folks want to know uh, to give them adequate background to make a choice. So that's pretty key. And that then um, significantly unloads what looks like an overwhelming
sufficient to uh, provide education. Then I think you have to provide the education when people are ready to hear it. And it sounds so straightforward, but the whole notion that you know we have to convey this stuff in the context of a clinical visit when you've got 15 other things to cover in the span of 10 minutes, it's not going to happen. Um, and so people have uh, lots of other times and opportunities in their lives. And, I mean, the, the lowest hanging fruit is the time people sit around the doctor's office waiting for something to happen. Right? And they're looking at People Magazine rather than what might be a more uh, educational approach to uh, what's about to happen. So I think if we use these much more accessible platforms of multimedia game uh, that folks can be uh, can access when they have the time and interest to do so, you know, that seems to me to be a wonderful window. It may well be the sort of thing where you have an appointment tomorrow, we're going to send you an email out tonight to say, why don't you look at this video, this will help you understand some of the issues that we want to talk about tomorrow. That's part of the issue with the newborn screening thing we talked about, moving into the prenatal arena. Obstetrician says yes. I mean, literally, it's, that's not their obligation. They see, they have so many other things that they think are uh, important for their um, professional, uh, but this isn't, getting this on the agenda is going to be a huge challenge. So I think we have to go around that uh, constraint. Okay. So when someone were raising the Minnesota Texas case, if those, if every state had a similar lawsuit, would we have thrown out, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of blood spots? If, you know, you, you use that legal argument that it is an argument, it's a legitimate argument, and could it be avoided? And I think this may be a connection, but I'm not sure. So if we had even an opt-out, and in the opt-out materials, it said in there, oh, cool. Is he all right? Yeah. And, and it even said in there, you know, these will be scored for research, which maybe it doesn't, I'm not sure. But it would be less likely to happen, and I, you talked about efficiency and effectiveness or whatever as the rationale for opt-out, but it's not an efficient system if you've thrown out five million spots. Yeah, well. So on balance, maybe it would be more efficient and effective if we had an opt-in that said as part of that, and for research purposes, we'll be keeping those visual spots. Yeah. So it's a long-term view of efficiency rather than a short-term. No, that's a good point. Michigan now has their biotrust that is an opt-in system for retaining residual blood spots. And I think the recent numbers I've seen is that they're getting about 60% uptake. Part of which is folks say no, but a big part of which is they don't get around to talking to people, and given the hectic environment there. So 60%, you know, if that's randomly distributed across the newborns, then uh, it's probably okay. If it's not, and you're missing significant parts of your population, then the value of the repository becomes uh, that much less. But I think your point's well taken, and it, it may be that making that commitment is worthwhile. Almost all programs now are putting a little bit of language in the brochure at this point that says uh, we may retain your blood spot for certain purposes, and if you don't like it, you know, call the health department sort of thing. So I think that's the approach to information that's so common within our system, which is takes the legal burden off us because it's there and we gave it to you. But uh, it doesn't really function as an effective decision-making tool. So we are out of time. I'm sorry, Karen, you can continue this conversation. Please join me in thanking Jeff.